Hello, good everyone. I hope you're fresh after the break. So I'm here to talk about oh, detox, but sorry, the other detox. I hope you're. Uh, I, I hope you'll um, you like it. Um, so uh, the talk is about end-to-end -end testing with detox. But before I really start, I want to ask how many of you do end-to-end -end testing on your current projects? OK, well, that's, that's a fair amount. And how many of you uh, use detox? Cool, cool. So I'm, I'm hoping really that we'll uh, head, up to, head, head up after the talk and maybe share some experiences. Anyway, my name is Wojtek Novak. You can find me under the uh, Vonovag handle on Twitter and on GitHub. As Mike said, I'm a member of the React Native community, and I make various small contributions across the React Native landscape. And I work for a company called Memsource, which is also based in Prague, Czech Republic, just like the Skype team. So maybe we can hang out on your rooftop. And let me talk about Memsource real quick. So Memsource is a company that develops one product, and that is a cloud tool for professional translations. So if you are a translation agency or maybe a big enterprise that has lots of content to translate between, between languages, you would choose Memsource to sort of help you make this process uh, professional. Uh, Memsource processes more than 2 billion words monthly, which makes us one of the biggest players in the field. And it includes like a project management tool and also something what I would call an IDE for translators. And really, Memsource is all about making the translation process more efficient to have it achieve higher quality consistency and, of course, reduce cost. And I will conclude by saying that it's very likely that you're using software that was translated using Memsource. Now, about, this, about the talk, my goals are to describe the journey that uh, my team went through and share some of the lessons learned. And let's start with testing permit. So because this is, I guess it's a mandatory thing for a testing talk. Um, so if you're not familiar with testing permit, it shows uh, like the ratio of different types of tests that you would find in a software project. So at the bottom, there are, there's a large number of unit tests. You can have thousands of them. Then there are fewer integration tests and even much, much fewer end-to-end -end tests. For example, in our React Native app, which is a companion to the other source tools, we have now slightly over 80 and 10 tests, and they take more than 25 minutes to run in CI, and they run on two uh, simulators at the same time. So compare this to, these, uh, to the other tests, that um, you, have, you can have thousands of them, and they will run in a minute or two. And let's talk about Detox. So Detox is a gray box testing framework uh, developed by Wix. It's open source and under the MIT license on GitHub. And this is an example of what Detox can look like when it's running. So you see that there is a simulator running. And in that simulator, um, there is an app which we interact with automatically using tests written in Detox. So there are maybe buttons that you can press and text fields that you can put text into and stuff like this. In fact, let's dive into a quick example, which is a login flow. So there is a simple please log in label two text inputs, and a button to log you in. This is what it would look like in, in React Native. So um, nothing unexpected. Again, there is a text input for the username, password, and the button. But the important thing to notice is the test ID prop, which, which is being passed over here. Then also for the, text for the other text input and for the login button. And the test ID prop is something that Detox can then use to interact with the elements in your app. So let's take a look at a test. Um, at the top, we have the expectation that we're, we're expecting to see the please login label. Then there are three actions. You, we, we type admin and admin into the username and password fields. And then we tap the login button. Now at this point, there is probably a network request fired, which will go to your server. It will come back into your app, and your user will be redirected to a home screen. And so maybe at the, at the end, we make an expectation that we are at the home screen. Now, Detox is, is clever enough 
to see that there is a network request going on before it runs the last expectation. So because it's a gray box testing tool, it actually injects some of its code into a running app. So it's able to observe what's going on in the app. And Detox can see that there's a network request and that there is rendering going on. And it will wait for those things to happen before it continues with the, text, uh, with the test. And this is a great thing. Now, in order to control the app, Detox needs to find those elements and work with them. And you would use so-called matchers to find those elements. And um, so by ID is, an, is a matcher that you would use to find elements by the test ID that I talked about. By text, we'll just scan the screen and look for elements with given text. There are more matchers, but these two will cover like more than 90% of your needs. Also, there are actions. So for buttons, you can tap, long press, multi-tap. You can also scroll and swipe left, right, up, and down. So really, Detox gives you the ability to control the app uh, from the user perspective. Um, there are also actions for typing text. I forgot that. So you would type, replace, and clear text. No rocket science. And of course, there are also expectations. So you can expect some elements to be visible, to exist somewhere in the screen, or to have certain text. And in those, um, yeah. And next up, I also want to cover the device object, which exposes some useful functionality, like for launching the app or reloading React Native, which is the same thing as the item in the dev menu. Also, there is open URL for deep linking or send notification for uh, notifications. Um, and so why would you, why would you, what's the motivation for end-to-end -end testing? In your end-to-end -end tests, you test your app from the user perspective. And so this means if you cover certain part of your app with end-to-end -end tests and they pass, this gives you confidence that the part of the app is working. And you don't need to write tens or hundreds of those end-to-end -end tests. You can maybe write just a few that will cover the most important parts of your app and stay with those. They will also give you confidence. And sort of the next chapter that I would like to cover is going from unit tests to end-to-end -end tests. Because in, our te in my team, and I think many other teams will have it the same way, we had experience with unit testing, but we started from zero with end-to-end -end tests. And I think there's, there's, there's some differences to cover. And the first thing I want to talk about is bootstrapping and tearing down the test environment. So chances are your app needs users, unless maybe you're making apps for robots. But let's include even robots. We count them in as users. So your app needs users. And for those users, you need, to, you need some data to show to them, whether it's to-do's, to-do items, or tweets, or anything else. And in your end-to-end -end tests, you'll need to create or generate all of this data or assets. So when you do this, your tests should, nof should assume nothing about what's going on around them. Every test suite should generate all the data it needs to be executed. And it's a good idea to co-locate the setup together with the test. Um, also, Tests should not rely on some manual setup that you do on, on the server, because if, if, you, if your end-to-end -end tests are um, coupled to some manual steps that you have done, um, they will not be maintainable. So everything should be done automatically. The next important thing is that your end-to-end -end tests must not interf interfere. What I mean by this is that, let's say you have a team of five developers working on five different feature branches in parallel, and so um, in your CI, you may run all these five pipelines in parallel, and in all those pipelines, end-to-end -end tests will be running. And you need to make sure that um, the tests running in one branch are not interfering with the other branch, because then, obviously, you will have a maintenance problem. To do this, um, you can maybe use entities with random or partially random names, so that your entities are unique, uniquely 
identified or named, and then those tests will be independent. Or maybe you can run all these tests against fresh server instance. What I mean by this is maybe that uh, maybe, your, maybe your service uh, can run in a Docker container, and then in your end-to-end -end test, you can just load up this Docker container, run your tests against this Docker container in complete isolation from other tests, and then when you're done, you just throw away the container and you have achieved um, independence. Now about tearing down the test environment, I think the only question here uh, to ask is, should those tests clean everything that they have created or should, they, should you keep it or not delete it at all? And um, sort of the lesson that I learned is that it's sometimes good to keep the data you have created in those end-to-end -end tests, keep, keep it longer, because then you may need it for debugging. You may need to know the data to find out what, what happened in those tests. Um, next up is um, the topic of before all versus before each, because in unit tests, you probably rarely ever use before all, but you probably often use before each, because you want all your unit tests to have the same baseline. Now, in end-to-end -end tests, this may mean doing more work than necessary. And I'll give an example of what I mean. This is Asana. It's a tool for project management or to-dos. So I have two to-dos, create slides for React Native EU until Thursday, and sure enough, I was working on them even today. <coughs> and so let's, let's say I tap onto this item, and I will get to a detailed page. On this detailed page, there are a number of things that I may want to test, such as the heading, or the assignment, or the due date. And if you use the before each approach, this will mean creating the user, uh, creating the to-do items, uh, going in there and tapping the item, and then testing the heading, and logging out. Again, for the assignment, you will create a user, create the items, go in there, check the assignment, log out. So lots, and similarly for the due date, you would have a lot of repeated steps. And sort of when, when you have sort of these like read-only tests that j are just checking that, the, that you create something and you're checking that the expected information is there, I think it's safe to use before all, where you just create the user, you log in, create those, uh, sorry, create user, those items, you log in, and then you run those three tests, and you're done, no repeated steps. This may not work always, of course, maybe if you're modifying or deleting those items. If you delete an item and then run a test that expects it to be there, it won't, it won't work. So in those cases, you need before each. Um, the next topic is test isolation. And I want to sort of give an example for this by going to shop on Amazon, because let's say I want to go to a camping trip, and for that trip I need a lightweight tent. And let's, let's go through the shopping flow on Amazon. Uh, so I look for a camping tent, a lightweight tent. Um, there is an Amazon cho Amazon's choice, so I'll take that. And also, I remember I need a water filter so that when I'm camping somewhere in the mountains, I can drink the water that I find there. So I, I will search for a water filter and put it in my card. They only sell two packs, I don't know why, but I have to deal with it, so I put it to the card. And now I proceed to check out. And because I lived at so many different places, I also need to choose the delivery address. And now I will get to some sort of a overview of my order. Oops. All right. So this is the this is the last step that I have ended at. And let's just take a look at that part of the screen. And there is there are several pieces of information that I want to test. Maybe it's the shopping address. Um, the item quantities, prices, or, or, or some other uh, items. And so let's, let's start and write a test for this. And this is our first attempt to write a test. And 
it's fairly simple. So at first, um, I visit the page for um, for shopping. Uh, sorry, for the tent. I I put it to the cart using that button, and then I have an expectation. I expect shopping cart to show number one. Similarly, for the second test, I go to the page, I add it to the cart, and I expect the shopping cart to show number two. And then at the third test, I go to the cart. I select the delivery address, and then there are two expectations at the bottom. So I expect correct delivery address, and I expect correct item quantities um, to be shown. And I guess maybe you're seeing the problem here. The one problem here is that the test number two actually depends on the test number one. So in order to run the second test successfully, you first need to run the first test. So there is a dependency between tests. And sure enough, the, the last test also depends on the previous ones because I'm checking the correct, I'm expecting the correct item quantities, which depends on the first and the second test. So when a developer comes to your project and they want to run just the third test, they will run it, but it'll fail because it assumes that the previous two tests were executed. And this is how we sort of started writing those tests, and I've also seen it maybe in some online examples, so I wanted to point this out that this, this is a problem because of the dependency and also because um, you cannot run these tests in parallel. You just, you just can't. And so how, how would we refactor this? And I guess there are two ways. One is to keep those tests short, like they are now, but in the second test, you will inevitably need to put some item to the card. You will sort of need to repeat some steps from the first step. Of you will need to, in the, in the second test, you will need to repeat some steps from the first one in order for the number to be two. And similarly, in the third test, you will need to repeat some steps from the previous tests so that the quantities are correct. So that's one way that will keep your tests small, which is good for maintenance, but there is some repetition of steps that is inevitable. The other way would be to write one huge test, which does just this entire flow, and then it will work but you will have a large test, long test, which has may maybe more points of failure and is harder to maintain. Um, I will leave this decision up to you. Maybe you can talk about it after the, after the talk. Maybe you, can, maybe you can combine the two approaches. Um, next big topic is flakiness and maintenance of tests. What is even flakiness? So you have your amazing feature branch, and there, is, and there are four builds for one comet, and two of those builds failed, and two of those builds succeeded. This is flakiness. Sometimes, somehow the end-to-end -end tests are sometimes good and sometimes bad. And I guarantee that if you do end-to-end -end testing, you will encounter this, 100% sure. Now, how do, we, how do we battle flakiness? Let's say you're integrating end-to-end -end tests in your project, and on Monday you're, you're, ha you're having a great day. You write five end-to-end -end tests, and they are all green. But at the end of the week, the situation may look more like this, where the first test obviously is pretty, is, is pretty awful. It's failing a lot. Test number two and five are good. Test number three has some problem, and you should also probably test, uh, take a look at test number four. And really having uh, some sort of historical data like this, I think, is crucial if you want to maintain a large set of end-to-end -end tests over long periods of time. You need to have some ability to, or some easy way to see what tests need attention and which tests are problematic. Instead of going through the logs, you want to take a look at a simple visualization like this. Also, this historical data has um, reporting value. Maybe you want, uh, you want to measure how many end, end tests you have created in the last quarter in your, in your team. And it also warns you about unusual things happening. What I have in mind by this is that, for example, I have made a mistake by wrongly renaming uh, a file with end, end tests, and those tests were not executed. 
so instead of 50 end to end tests, we were maybe running 42 or something like that. And we didn't find out until two or three weeks later. So this is really important. How do you debug end to end tests? And there are several parts of this. The first one is the native part. There are tools. In Xcode, it's Debug View Hierarchy tool, and in Android Studio, it is Layout Inspector. It looks like this in Xcode. So on the right, there is a there is a simple login screen, and I have attached a debugger and opened the Debug View Hierarchy tool, and I can just click through all those elements, and I have in the zoomed in area, I have found out the login username text input. You see that it's an instance of our CTUI text field, and there is the identifier, which is the test ID. And in Android, similarly, it looks like this in Android Studio. Now, the JS part. Uh, you can just pass the inspect BRK flag to the node process, and then you can open up the Chrome inspector, and you will be able to run the JavaScript in Chrome with breakpoints and so on, even though you may have trouble with source maps. This slide is to remind me of a, of a story that happened to me. So we had n tests that were, or let's say one test that was extremely flaky. It was sometimes failing, sometimes it was green, on and on like this. And so I went on to take a look at it, and I found out that the problem was actually in the setup part, in the before each or all part. And so the, the n -tent tests were fine. The problem was in the setup part, but it manifested itself through flaky end, end tests. So I looked at the code and I found out where the bug was, and I really found out that the easiest way to fix the bug would be to write a failing test for the setup code. And that fixed my problem, and I just found it funny that I was writing tests, unit tests for my setup code in order to run end-to-end -end tests. So just be prepared that you may write tests for tests. Um, so remember at the beginning I talked about how um, Detox is clever enough to wait for some actions or expectations if there is some network or rendering work going on. Uh, so this doesn't work in 100% of the cases. And in that case you can use this debug synchronization flag, pass it a number like 200 milliseconds, and Detox will print out logs of what, what, like what's going on, what's, what's, what it's waiting for that's taking longer than 200 milliseconds. And in some cases, um, the, the synchronization logic of Detox will get in your way, so you can, of course, turn it off and do things manually. Of, uh, also, Detox offers video recordings for debugging, which is great. It helps, especially in cases where um, um, there's some like tricky visual thing going on that you, you don't even spot it when you run the test, but you need to see the video and see sort of slowly again what was going on. Detox will give you usually fairly detailed logs of errors, but from those logs you may not always find out what the problem is. So this helps. Next up, some tips and tricks. So take a look at this table of tests. All of them are red, but does that necessarily mean that all of them are bad? Well, maybe not. Um, let's take a look at a timeline. So these are all those tests on the timeline, and the first test is running. It logs the user in, and then it fails. And because it fails, also the logout fails. And that means that the next user who's trying to log in for the second test cannot log in because the login screen is not shown. And you're wondering, well, wait a second, why would a logout fail? What does that even mean? So let's take a look at a screenshot from the Facebook app. How do you log out now? Well, maybe you have to go back once, and then there is the menu, or, and you can log out. But maybe you need to go back twice to get to the main screen. Well, you never know. At, at any point in those tests, the way to logging out may be different. And you, you don't want, like Detox is not clever enough to find out how to log in from a uh, logout from your app, and you don't want to probably create all possible code, I mean, app paths to get to logout. So you somehow need to make sure that at the beginning of each test, the test starts at a login screen so that the user can log in. And we have <laughs> used, a colleague of mine came up with this 
idea that we have sort of a global logout button. <laughs> and I think, I, I'm sure, of course, you, th you think, well, well, that's a hack, and I agree, but, <laughs> but it ha I, I, I think it's actually a brilliant idea, and it has, it's, been, it's been working for us. So this is, this is like a top-level component. We're using React Navigation. So it's rendered on top of all the content, so it's always there in those end-to-end -end tests. And so wherever you are, however the previous, end test, uh, the previous test ends, you can log out. It's also a time saver, because logging out is not always a quick thing, like in the web. To log out, maybe you need to go five screens back and then type somewhere, confirm, and it's just taking time. So this is a, also a time saver. Another time saver is deep linking. So instead of tapping to get to fifth screen, you're just deep linking there. Also, so um, how do we serve different content for end-to-end -end tests? And it's actually fairly simple. You just pass this complicated environment variable to the packager. And if you, so I have passed e2e.js, which means the packager will prefer files with e2e.js extension before those like normal JS files. Also, I think it's a good idea to use conventions in your intent tests. So remember I said um, that you're testing from user perspective. And so I think it's a good idea, and we have taken this from another team in, in, in Memsource, to prepend those user actions with the word user, because that will make the code more readable and more understandable. To give an example, user adds item to shopping cart or user goes to profile screen, as opposed to find element profile screen dot tab, which also works but doesn't tell you so much. You can also use conventions for the expectations. Maybe you will prepend them with expect, assert, or you're just going to make a statement like correct items are in cart, and that's a statement, and that's an expectation. Um, you can also use some shortcuts. So Detox comes with a complete API, which but sometimes may be quite verbose. So you can save some parentheses and typing and also make it maybe more readable. And you can even go further than this. You can just have a function that will tap an element by ID. As always, there are some limitations. So, <laughs> uh, for example, I maintain the React Native Google Sign-In repo in, in the GitHub org. And I wanted to write end-to-end -end tests for that because they make more sense than unit tests. And so I found out that I started with iOS and I found out that the so when you tap the Google sign-in button, it will show up a dialog, and the dialog is just not visible to, to Detox. Detox just doesn't see it, and that's because Detox um, cannot control like other apps or processes, and that sign-in uh, model was coming from a different process. And this also pertains to WebView. And there are probably more limitations. Uh, this is a quick tip for cross-platform tests. I'm sure you, aware, you are aware of the platform.select in Core React Native. You can um, write your own platform select for end-to-end -end tests and nicely describe which, text, which, which uh, code should be executed on what platform. Fairly uh, simple. Next step is removing the test ID prop from those uh, React elements, because you don't need to ship the test IDs to production users. The only thing they will do is um, eat up memory. So you can remove them for the production build. Um, next up, I don't have a lot of experience with this, but I also wanted to quickly mention Detox Instruments, because uh, this is a profiling tool that you can run with your Detox tests, and it records some profiling data, such as network activity, CPU uh, state, or memory footprint. It looks like this. There are some yeah, charts that tell you how much resources the app is consuming. And there is also a cool API, events API, 
that, for example, can tell you upon your app startup how much time it spent loading up some JS, uh, JS required, some, some JS module, or how much time it spent in native modules. And it can project all this data together with, um, with the image that I have shown previously, so you can look for um, the problems there. What are the conclusions? And <laughs> I have an image for this. It's about CI, but I think it also relates to end-to-end -end testing. I want to say, I want to say explicitly that end-to-end -end testing is hard and is time-consuming, and it will probably always be the case. It takes time and patience. Sometimes it will make you angry. But overall, um, you can do it, and it works. It does catch bugs. And I think that's it. So thank you for listening. <laughs>